One of my favorite movie quotes is from Saving Saving Private Ryan, where an elder Private Ryan in the first scene, opening scene, says, I hope I've lived a life that has honored your sacrifice. Tonight, my remarks are dedicated to my father, Dr. Shaq Yan Chow, who recently passed away unexpectedly, and whose life and memory I try to honor and eat, uh, each and every single day. As an immigrant from China, he came to the U.S. for a better life as a young college student. He met my mother, and as we say, the rest is history. They ended up having two children, my brother and I. And growing up as an immigrant family, libraries were a cornerstone of our lives. Books, movies, documentaries, a safe space to explore, and endless adventures, all for free. As a married graduate uh, student couple with children, they didn't have a lot of disposable income, and the library was our refuge, our place of adventure. I'm proud to say that my father lived a full life through hard work and serving as a dedicated husband and father. He led a life that was well lived. Some lessons I want to impart to you are in honor of his memory. First, make sure you also live a life well lived. We don't know when our end will arrive, and so make sure to set aside time to embrace and relish the things that make you happy, make you laugh, and bring you joy. Make sure this is also done honor and respect to others. Second, make sure you tell your loved ones frequently how much you love and appreciate them and care for them. And that certainly includes our pets uh, and friends and relatives. Third, libraries and LAS professionals bring so much joy, comfort, and serve as a safe space and place for people of all walks of life. My parents learned how to use computers at their public library in Florida. It served a core role in their quality of life across the lifespan, and especially as they retired. Fourth, I am proud to say through the SJSU iSchools IMLS grant entitled Reading Nation Waterfall, which is building book ecosystems for Native American children and communities in five tribes nationally. And I also want to recognize Sophia LaMonica, who I, has been a, a project manager and co-conspirator over her time with us at the iSchool. We're building book ecosystems for Native American children and communities in five tribes nationally. We created a new program called Reading Nation Waterfall Sunrise in partnership with the Unite for Literacy Little Free Library and the National Indian Head Start Directors Association, which should add close to 20,000 books in those ecosystems for Native American children in memory of my father. You would like that. My father lived the life where giving and providing for others was his primary priority and contribution. And this is similar to the iSchool's um, philosophy. And in particular, we have a saying, which is information is everything. With a focus on serving others, helping people solve problems and helping increase their quality of life, or by providing access to vetted high quality information, services, programming, and resources. This is such an incredible opportunity and privilege to serve others as LAS professionals. And certainly given the time, times that we live in now, our profession could not be uh, more important. In conclusion, all of our new graduates are empowered with your new degree to move forward in your careers and lives. We stand on the shoulders of those that have come before us, and we honor their memories and sacrifices every day by helping others and solving problems head on with strength, courage, vigor, and integrity. As you grow strong in your careers, remember it is an increased opportunity to also help even more people. Congratulations on earning your degree, and we are honored to have been a small part of your life's journey. Do keep in touch. Let us know how you're doing. Let us know how we can help you as you progress through your assuredly successful careers. Remember, all great things are earned by facing and working through a lot of challenges, solving a lot of problems, and continue to grow and learn through our mistakes. Work hard, be kind to others, and live a life well lived. It's your time now to do great things, and we know you're up to the challenge. Thank you. All right, so next uh, we have Associate Dean Sandy Hirsch, who is the former iSchool director and now our Associate Director, uh, who'd like to say a few words. 
Oh, hi, everyone. Um, on behalf of the College of Professional and Global Education, I bring greetings and congratulations from Interim Dean Mike Matt, who's not able to join us today. I am currently serving as the Associate Dean for Academics in the college, and I previously served as the Director of the School of Information for 10 years. And it gives me great pleasure to be here today on behalf of the Dean's Office to congratulate the graduates of the School of Information. Through your course of study in the School of Information, you have all gained a deep understanding of how information can be applied to address some of the world's most challenging problems. And you have gained the skills and knowledge that will enable you to make a difference in your communities. I congratulate the School of Information's outstanding master's degree students who are graduating with their MLIS MARA and informatics degrees, those who've completed their teacher librarian programs and certificate programs, and also the iSchool's undergraduate students who are completing their BS in information science and data analytics. While today we are celebrating the end of one segment of your career journey, it is also just the first step in what we know will be a rewarding, inspiring, and impactful future. I am excited to see what the future holds for you, and I know that you will go on to achieve great things. Congratulations, and best luck on your next adventure. Thank you very much, Sandy, and congratulations on, on helping build the iSchool to what it is today. So next, uh, we have the honor of Elizabeth Martinez as our first keynote speaker. She currently is a New Mexico State Library Commissioner, former high school lecturer here at San Jose State, and former executive director of the American Library Association. She also is the author of A Jaguar in the Library. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining us. Go ahead. Hello, and thank you. Thank you, and gracias. I'm very pleased to be here. I have a caveat, unfortunately, and that's that uh, earlier this week, I was released from the hospital after five days. And so one of the medications that I take, a side effect is coughing. <laughs> so if I start to cough during this talk, I apologize and I'll stop as quickly as I can. But thank you. Thank you. For that. When I was executive director of the American Library Association, we had a case before the Supreme Court the Supreme Court. It was ALA versus United States government. And we, we refer to it as freedom of the internet, access to the internet. This was the 1996 Telecommunications Act. Our attorney and their attorney, the government's attorney, were told you have three minutes, three minutes to make your case because after that, the chief justices will start asking questions. Well, three minutes, <laughs> three minutes isn't very long. It was suggested that I talk about what I've learned in my profession. And that's daunting because I've been a librarian for 50 years. I know most of you weren't born then, but that's, I understand how long that was. But I learned at three minutes, maybe I couldn't do it, but seven minutes, surely I could do that. And I learned to be fast, concise, and brief. I learned to be ready. I learned to be ready for opportunities, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. Ready for the unanticipated, ready for the non-routine, ready for the great idea from a quiet staff member, ready for a door to open that appears to have been closed, ready for challenges to get things done, to make things happen. And somewhere out there in this universe of people attending this event, there's a friend, and I want to tell you a story about Dr. Anthony Bernier. Please forgive me, Anthony. <laughs> when I was appointed director of the Los Angeles Public Library, it was a time of construction, the new central library after an infamous fire. The over half a million square foot new central library would be a blend of the 1928 good hue, elaborate, magnificent building that had sculptures and mosaics and Mayan and Egyptian motifs and, and an enormous astrological chandelier in the rotunda. And it was to be blended with a seven story, very modern series of escalators that went up 
uh, and, and throughout the building, and it was surrounded by books. You could go up and down the escalator, see books all around you. It was called the Grand Canyon of Books by one of the TV anchors. There were gardens and there were fountains and there was a classy restaurant. There was a food court. There was a gift shop. There was a 250-seat theater. It was estimated that over 80,000 people attended. Celebrities, authors, icons. I gave Big Bird a library card and he gave me a yellow feather. There were celebrities. It was a wonderful time for the community. But what was important is something that happened a week later. Because a week later, a librarian asked to talk to me. And if you've been to the Central Library, you know how magnificent it is, and you ought to see the library director's office. It's pretty wonderful. So the librarian was Anthony Bernier. He wasn't Dr. Anthony Bernier yet. But he told me something that startled me. And it said, he told me that in over... The half a million square foot new, brand new, magnificent library. There were less than a thousand square feet for teens. And I, I was shocked. I was an advocate for teens. I knew better. I knew I hadn't been involved in the design of the facility, but I certainly was involved in everything else, including the opening and the management. And I knew that less than a mile from the new beautiful Central Library was the largest high school in Los Angeles. And those students could just come straight down the road to the new library. And we didn't have enough space. I left LA to be um, the executive director of the American Library Association. But Anthony stayed and he made sure that teens got space. And it the new teen space of Los Angeles Public Library, it proclaimed a new era in teen services by public libraries. I started an entirely new service. And I'm always grateful, a little embarrassed by what happened, but always grateful to have learned. Because he showed me that while I was involved with all of the politics and the opening and the media, and I didn't pay attention to those details, and I should have. I'm a big picture person but I need to know the details too. And Anthony talked. He showed me that way. Thanks, Anthony. I always remember that. So what have I learned working in libraries for all these years? Uh, I've learned that change isn't really that difficult. All you need is ganas. G-A-N-A-S, ganas in Spanish means will. That's all you need. I learned that there's always money. Don't believe people that say there's no money. There's money. I learned how to find it, where it is, the different accounts, the different budgets. It's not in the budget everybody looks at. But I learned to find money, and I learned to find people who could donate money. I learned that policies are not laws. They can be changed. I learned that practice is only what we did yesterday. It's not what we have to, we need to do you know, tomorrow. I learned to find colleagues who supported us, and especially me. I learned to find and follow details that would become important in the future. I learned that staff know what is needed <laughs> much better than I did. All I, all I needed to do was say, yes, I didn't have to do it myself. They were perfectly capable and better at it. I learned to say yes to most requests especially those that came from the public, because they had great ideas for programs. I learned from my experiences. After watching a movie, the first Chicano movie, I Am Joaquin, a man who had been sitting behind me tapped me on the shoulder. He tapped me on the shoulder and he said, or asked, are you the librarian working at East LA Library? And before I could answer, before I could answer, he said, we need you. We need you. Those words changed my entire career. My career path was set in stone from then on. It was a time when libraries did not have multicultural services, collections, books, staff who spoke other languages. It was very Euro Eurocentric and very white centric and it didn't exist. So I became the first Chicano librarian, also the oldest <laughs> Chicano librarian. So my 
career path changed, my profession opened up, and I became an advocate for multilingual, multicultural services. And it's still something that I do. Libraries that had staff at that point didn't speak the languages. Libraries didn't have collections or histories or programs about other people. And that started to change. Today, it seems normal and natural, but it wasn't then. In the 70s, I established four ethnic resource centers, the first ones in Los Angeles County and in the nation, the American Indian, the Asian Pacific Islander, the Black and the Chicano Ethnic Resource Centers. They're still thriving today. And they collect, manage, and you can have access to all of the documents of local history on all the cultural peoples of Los Angeles County. I also learned how to stand up to my community. A world famous architect designed a library that librarians didn't like. The community liked it, the children liked it, the city liked it, <laughs> but librarians didn't because it was very hard to supervise. It wasn't a big room where you could look out and see everything. It was instead, as the architect said, I want people to go room to room and discover books. And that's what they did. A little reading tower, a little garden, places where you walk and you could read and you could enjoy the library. But I learned to speak up about it. I learned that, yes, I would have to pay twice the cost to staff that facility because it wouldn't be easy. But it was worth it because that's what the community wanted. I also learned about wonder. When a librarian at Michelangelo's library in Florence said to me, Elizabeth, we know who you are. And we have something we think you would enjoy looking at. Well, to my surprise and enjoyment, she pulled out an enormous metal, big metal book. It was leather and it had a big key and it had a big lock. And she opened it up and she said, this is a Mayan codex. And she gave me time to look through the pages, beautiful, brilliant paintings of all colors of wildlife and birds and clothes and food and mountains, people. It was an encyclopedia of the Mayan culture. And I spent time with that and I learned about wonder. When the millennium was approaching, <laughs> I was looking for the Andrew Carnegie of the 21st century. Why? Because as executive director of the American Library Association, I knew that most libraries did not have computers or the internet. How could you enter the 21st century, the century of technology? How could you enter it without computers and access to the internet? My staff had calculated that it would take $900 million to get every public library in the country a computers, public computers, not just for staff, public computers, software, and access to the internet. Well, who has $900 million? So I asked Bill Gates. I thought, he's a 21st century icon. We gave him a proposal. And 18 months later, he called and said, I'll give you $200 million. And that's for libraries that are in what we then called the government's poor zip codes. So with $200 million, we could equip libraries with computers. Imagine that. Today, they're everywhere. <laughs> then they were the first. My staff and I were ready for this big project. I also learned that some challenges are very personal, became very personal. Because I had heard and I could certainly experienced and testified to the fact that a profession is not diverse. It wasn't then and it's not now. It's still 90% librarian, non librarians of color. So I gathered a group of friends, California friends, you know, the friends that you don't have to tell them what it's about. You don't have to justify. You don't have to document it. You don't have to convince people, friends who know the issue. And I contacted them, and so we gathered. We gathered in Pasadena. We said that I was the library director, and we met with him. And it was Cheryl Matoyer. 
Cherokee, Janice Koyama, Japanese American, Benny Tate Wilkin, Black American, Patricia Tarin, Mexican American. And the six of us got together and said, how do we start the diversification of this profession? So we made a plan. The plan was to ask ALA for $1.5 million. This was 1996, $1.9 million. And we wanted five years, 50 scholarships, 50 scholars a year, and each would get $5,000. And that would be the beginning. Well, Spectrum was established. It became a hot commodity and people now support it wholeheartedly. And there's over 3,000 Spectrum scholars, librarians now. 3,000 we didn't have before. So things can happen. The challenge is there. You just have to be ready. And you have to take the consequences of those who don't always agree with you. There are recently, I had a call from a former ALA friend and she said, Elizabeth, I, I want you to help us recruit scientists of color, scientists. And I'm thinking, I've never done that before. Didn't say anything, but didn't, done, haven't done that before. But I was ready. I was ready to help a, a colleague who wanted to diversify the scientific community. And so she says, you know, senescent cells, senescent cells. Yes. You know, the cells that don't multiply the cells in your body that don't multiply and they're connected to the elder, to the elderly. So this is a pilot project. There's new research. It's going to be fantastic. We want you to help us recruit scientists of color and place them in labs all around the country. So college students, 16 of them last summer, were placed at MIT and Stanford and Duke and Yale and Northwestern and throughout the country to study senescent cells. And I think that's what taught me was that there's always time to learn something new. I'm not a scientist. I'm not even in bioinformatics. She said to me, don't worry about it. We'll get a researcher or a PI to give you a crash course and you'll know all about Simpson cells, you know, in a week. So be ready to learn. Be ready to wonder. Be ready to, for the challenges that are ahead of you. Be ready to leave your mark on the profession. Think about when you're almost ready to retire. I know that seems like a long time now and people aren't retiring. But think about it. When you leave one job to another job, what did you leave behind? What did you accomplish? How did you help other people? What Whose doors did you open? Because many people opened my doors. I, I couldn't have done half of, the, of the, my accomplishments without somebody else helping me. And so be ready. Be ready. Leave evidence of your good work. Be excited. Be ready for wonder. Be ready for the excitement of a new profession, meeting new people and new colleagues. Be ready for an opportunity to do good for your community. So my question to you now is, are you ready? Are you ready for the opportunities that this profession is going to provide for you? Because that's where you are. You're ready to step into that profession and the opportunities will be there. So congratulations and welcome to the librarian's world of opportunities. Thanks a lot. Truly inspiring, Elizabeth. And again, let's give her a loud round of applause for not only a wonderful remarks, but her commitment and impact on our society through her leadership. So again, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for joining us and thank all you. that you've done for, her, for our thank country. You. Thank you. So our next speaker, uh, we are delighted to have uh, Rob Lloyd. So Rob Lloyd is a uh, deputy city manager for the city of San Jose, and he also served as the former city uh, chief uh, information officer. Uh, so let me turn it over to you, Rob. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, so good evening, class of 2024. It's uh, wonderful to see some faces of our newest professionals and leaders 
Uh, my thanks to San Jose State University and the School of Information, Dr. Chow and Dr. Wong, for the invitation to speak with you. Uh, we in Silicon Valley think highly of SJSU's graduates. Um, as much as any class since the emergence of the internet, you are coming into this professional world to shape our next 25 years and beyond. Um, our horizon is filled with tremendous change and fundamental questions. We have six generations working together for the first time, uh, the rapid rise of generative artificial intelligence and the path towards general AI will change how we work, the, the jobs people will hold, and will reshape economies as well as communities. There's both excitement and apprehension in that. We have questions about how to shape common values when social connections are down across the board, uh, marriage rates, participation in social and volunteer organizations, attendance at churches, time with peers at work. How do we handle our changing values and needs related to privacy and securing the digital infrastructure and services of nations? As scholars, you see more than most how we are struggling to determine basic truths in a very noisy world of information and media. The ability of AI to generate images and our audio artifacts that warp reality, that make the fake convincing as the real, that's only going to undermine our ability to know what we can believe and agree to address. All that's to say is you're going to be world-class problem solvers because we have heavy world-class problems. But you've studied information and technology. You see the world as it should be. And to paraphrase Alan Simpson, those that travel the high road of humility and hard work are not often bothered by heavy traffic but they are among the best of us, and we need your humble work and leadership. Um, a story for you. I see a lot of smart people on our teams, ones who work to rise and have opportunities in their careers. About five years ago, we had two come through as fellows from different programs. By most uh, measures, uh, equally bright, equally hardworking. Both rose quickly to mid-level managers leading in areas of data science and equity, planning and permitting and homelessness, same age, and both had their master's degrees. As they rose, uh, we started to see one stay on a fast path. The other ran into more barriers uh, they couldn't overcome without increasing help. We coached, we mentored, but we started to see clearly a gap between the two emerge. Whereas one truly thirsted for feedback, developed the emotional strength to see critiques as gifts, and dedicated energy to building strong relationships with others, the other started to communicate to us in very different terms. Critical feedback meant that others didn't respect or trust them. Critiques from team members were interpreted as micromanagement of their work. They couldn't have to work so hard because People have different opinions and wouldn't agree, and, and how is that my problem? Criticisms show we aren't a supportive team and, and that kind of language. From the other, we heard conversations like, dang, I hadn't thought of that point. Let me work on this policy to make it better. Can I go into the field with you so I understand how this process will work for you and your team? Uh, some of the lessons that Elizabeth mentioned. There are some new legal requirements coming. Can we team up to plan how we address them? Or even, I didn't know that. Can you teach me how those things work at police so we can address the public safety needs and plan the community engagement? Uh, or they sent out a message, please hammer this report hard and give me feedback. It's important to our plans for the next few years and I need to get it right. Guess which of those emerging stars is now part of the executive team for one of our departments and has emerged as a leading young voice in their field nationally. There are lessons in that story because we see it so often. Consistent elements to success with others, especially where there's fast adaption to change that's required in an environment. One is having expertise in an area of important knowledge. There's another great skill in being able to get good work done and having people's trust because you have a high say-do ratio. And the last is harder to achieve and takes humility. And that's the ability to build relationships that make you better. How many times have we seen that? Um, a really smart person who talks but can't deliver, or maybe even is a jerk. 
um, the person who works hard but often does it poorly or wrong uh, and refuses to learn what's next. But saddest is the person who is smart and does good work but self-limits because they can't connect with others. They don't take the time to relate. They struggle to listen or are unable to improve based on the wisdom of others. They're alone and in the shallows. But if you hit all three marks, I guarantee you, you will be successful. And our professionals in, in the first parts of their careers are making decisions differently. We see that. You are more likely to accept jobs with companies that show diversity in teams and leadership. You are communicating a sense of values and your hiring processes and a willingness to look for employers that roughly match your values or at least don't conflict with them. You are more diverse and celebrate, celebrate traditions of many cultures. To you, diversity is not is celebration. It's not just tolerating people. And you look for work teams where people can share and critique and grow together. And you stay with those high growth teams and bosses longer than other people. You've shown that personally. Uh, you're here today. You've worked to become better experts through your master's program. Uh, you've been consistent and put yourself in a place of learning and critique on the daily. You're emerging professionals and leaders in important areas to communities and industry. And I want to be clear, you will change things for the better. So all that said, I, I hope that sounded professional and, and important, but I, I have a favor to ask for you. And, and I'd like to end our time a little differently. Um, I think some of us remember Mr. Rogers. Um, and, and, and kind of lessons he gave us. So all and each of us have people who have helped us come to this moment tonight. Uh, parents, siblings, grandparents who are always in our corner, friends who root us on from here or far away, uh, a coworker who took an extra shift to help us balance classes or who were just happy to see us do well, maybe a professor or classmate who gave the extra time you needed to understand something better, our partners who sacrifice to support us and who give us assurance in our moments of doubt. Even loved ones who are past and who may be looking down on us. These are people who have shown us a largeness of heart and who have loved us into being the individuals who are here today smiling. And so the favor I have for you is, will you please take 20 seconds with me to just think of those people? to appreciate the strength they give us in life, a small moment of silence and devotion. And I'll say, don't worry, I'll watch the time. So those people you thought of, how proud they are of you how full their hearts to know that you feel they made a difference in your life and how contented they must feel to have seen you grow through the years and watch you shine today. In a time when the world seems inhumane, these connections and moments are what remind us about human bonds and the care we need to choose to hold. So with that, I just wanna say we are proud of you. We look forward to seeing the positive marks you make on this world I know you'll be helpers that others need, and you'll be the ones that combine the nobility of talent and hard work and compassion. And so on behalf of our San Jose community and your SJSU family, we're in your quarter, we're rooting you on, and congratulations. Thank you so much, Rob. Let's everyone please give Rob a, a loud round of applause. Uh, Rob, again, it's a real honor to have you uh, join us tonight, and we thank you for all of your leadership and the work that you're doing uh, in San Jose. Uh, and I also want to provide context, uh, especially for families and friends. So the School of Information uh, has four uh, degrees. Uh, first is the Master in Library Information Science. Uh, we um, typically average around 2,600 students nationally, and we are by far the largest uh, MLIS provider uh, in the country and actually the world. But we also have uh, three other degrees um, and two of which are, are represented, uh, uh, I think, largely tonight um, and, and actually uh, is a master's in informatics, uh, a master's in archives and records management. And then our newest um, 
uh, degree, which uh, Dr. Hirsch had mentioned earlier, is our Bachelor's of Information Science and Data Analytics. And so uh, this is why we, we um, have uh, two, key, two keynote speakers really talking about our two major areas of service. So, uh, and in fact, uh, I did want to give a shout out to any of our bachelor's um, graduates. Do we have any? Uh, because uh, this is actually only our uh, third year uh, in, in, uh, in offering this degree. So, wonderful. Okay, so uh, now uh, we are delighted to uh, invite our student speaker, uh, uh, Tree Blossom. So, Tree, go ahead. Thank you for joining. Oh, yeah, this is uh, great. What a wonderful way to celebrate. Um, I, Tree Blossom, pronouns are he, him. And I want to start with my father and my father. I want to start with my father and my father. And I want to start with my father and my father. If I don't have a father, I don't have a father. I don't have a father. My father is here. Um, you're my rock. Um, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. And um, my anak, I, my children, I love you so much. Very proud of you. Um, your dad's graduating. Uh, academics, education. Keep doing that. Um, dear graduates, whew, I am proud, so very proud of the journey you are embarking on. I am so proud. I decided to join you on this journey as well. Yep, that's right. Six years ago. Yeah. Um, spent a decade in librarianship and, and it, I'm having a blast. It's fun. So graduates, remember your why and maintain the focus of your wish for librarianship. You are leaders of the greatest public service that any community organization, nonprofit, and business could ever have. Graduating is to embark on a journey full of new challenges, experiences, realities, connections, opportunities, and possibilities. Librarians of today and into the and into the future, I believe in all of your brilliance and moving and guiding the profession to new heights. Be leaders that will challenge the status quo. Be leaders that will engage in the practice and value of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. Challenge yourself to lean into difficult conversations. Engage in experiences that will involve you in the richness of librarianship throughout your career. Librarianship is an adventure of co-creating what seems unreal into new realities, where meaningful connections empower communities to thrive and grow. An honorable and beautiful profession that collaborates with community members from all walks of life so that the greatness of, the, of a community can shine bright. Yeah, we get to do this work. The field of library and information science is a vast arena with limitless possibilities and opportunities for librarians to embed themselves in. That's right, embed librarianship everywhere, y'all. So go, go and be lifelong learning librarians and bring with you the core values of librarianship, access, confidentiality, democracy, diversity, education, lifelong learning, the public good, preservation, professionalism, service, social responsibility, and sustainability. I wish to congratulate you all today and thank you and thank you for embarking on this journey that will involve your leadership of self, your leadership to your teams, and your leadership to the community. Welcome to the library community, y'all. Wonderful remarks, Tree. Thank you so much. And let's uh, join join me in congratulating uh, Tree and uh, for, for an excellent uh, speech. Also, uh, I want to recognize our outstanding faculty and staff. Uh, so, faculty and staff, if you could just say hello in the chat, 
uh, and let's give them a huge round of applause for, for their service, their, their excellence, their support uh, throughout this process. Obviously, we could not, we would not be here without all of you. Thank you so much. And finally, uh, let us uh, again applaud um, our new graduates. Uh, we are going to um, have a slideshow where we get to meet them. And again, uh, for parents and friends, it'll be an opportunity for you to give a shout out and recognize your loved ones. Again, congratulations. You did it. Uh, before we go into the slideshow, I did also want to share with you uh, a, uh, a unique opportunity. Um, uh, we are going to uh, be live streaming um, uh, uh, the physical commencement on Monday. Uh, one of our graduates we will be wearing a MetaQuest 3 and, be, and live, live stream their entire experience uh, via YouTube. Uh, and uh, Alfredo, if you could drop that link uh, in, in the chat, uh, if, for those of you that are, will not be able to attend in person on Monday, uh, feel free to check that link out and actually experience the entire event uh, through the eyes of a graduate that will be there, including getting hooded uh, on, uh, on stage. So, um, all right, so without, uh, without further ado, let's uh, go to uh, our slideshow, Bethany.